Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the University of Denver and to the fantastic Newman Center. I'm Amanda Moore McBride and I'm Dean of the Graduate School of Social Work. This is one event in our series that we have entitled Catalyst for Social Justice. How many of you came to last year's event, the storytelling? Yeah, look at the hands in the air. We're going to see some tears on the faces pretty soon, right, folks? Uh, uh, tears, laughs, uh, joy, and connection. I appreciate how many people we have here tonight, and um, I can feel some of the nervousness and excitement from our storytellers <laughs> are here on the floor. I, um, I have to say, this series means a lot to us at a School of Social Work. We think that stories have the power to change people. They can change minds. They can change hearts. They can change policies. So how do we create opportunities then to curate your own story so that you can carry it forth in the world? It is an art, maybe even a little bit of science after your five hours of workshopping, right? The last two days. So we're delighted that we have a brave group of 10 folks, faculty, staff, students, alumni, who are willing to stand before us tonight live without notes and discuss wellness. Last year, our theme was around identity and equity. This year, we've chosen a more substantive focus around wellness, allowing people to talk about the intersections of mental wellness, physical wellness, social wellness, and how that has shown up in their lives. I'm delighted for their bravery and that they were willing to commit to go through the training and be with us tonight. We wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for our facilitators and for a repeat uh, session with them. We have uh, Julian Goldhagen and Catherine McCarthy, and what I love is that they're both social workers. Um, <laughs> even if they didn't get it from GSSW, we still love them. <laughs> they, they both have an incredible career in the arts where they have brought storytelling to, to youth, to young people, to different professionals, and allowing them to learn these skills and to carry that forward. And we're delighted that they're here tonight. They're going to serve as MCs, talk a little bit more about what storytelling means to them and the process that our storytellers went through, and then we'll get with it. So in the meantime, go ahead and dig out your Kleenex. Thank you all for being here. Good evening, everybody. Woo, how are we doing? Awesome. So thank you for that lovely introduction, Dean McBride. Um, my name is Julian. Um, and as Dean McBride mentioned, myself, along with the amazing Catherine McCarthy, um, we have been here on campus for the past two days um, working with a group of 16 folks from the University of Denver community, from the greater Denver community, um, doing exactly what Dean McBride beautifully actually mentioned to you all, kind of really working with stories as a tool for social change. So in our group, we had folks who were social workers, who were advocates, who were educators, who were writers, who were really working in diverse areas um, and, and through diverse means to really pursue equity. And so it was a privilege for us this weekend to get to spend the time hearing their stories and really learning from them and hopefully imparting some of our tools to help them be even more um, strategic and effective with the stories that they tell. Um, so Catherine and I are from an, a, a collective called Speech Act. We are a New York-based collective and we are entirely dedicated to um, thinking about how to use stories as a tool and as a tactic to sort of move the needle towards social justice. Um, and so this work looks different with different groups, but we facilitate workshops and we do all kinds of work that's really about how do we use our narratives strategically to inform policy, to galvanize communities, to educate, and really to pursue equity in a way that is more difficult to do, perhaps through um, just data um, and policy briefings alone. Those things are obviously really important, but we really do believe that stories and speaking to our humanity can make some of these larger and more abstract and more complex concepts and issues um, grounded in the person and viscerally connected to communities for change. Um, so, this past two days, we have been working in small groups, we've been doing a lot of brainstorming, we have been doing a lot of crafting, listening to stories, giving feedback to each other, really workshopping our own experiences so that they are the most effective um, kind of 
Speaking of those experiences as we can um, muster up today, we love to think of stories as constantly works in progress. So what we're going to see today are seven beautifully crafted works in progress that are going to be unfolding on stage live without notes. So every time these stories find voice, they're a little bit different. Um, it depends on the storyteller's feelings. It depends on the people in the room. And so we thank you very much for being here and for sharing this space with us. It's really impossible to create these interpersonal dynamics through storytelling without ears to listen to it. So you all are playing a very important role. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, we've got seven storytellers this evening, just to give you some kind of technical um, idea of what you're about to see. So we will have all seven storytellers tell about five minute long stories. Um, and that's just so you know, it's not gonna be like that cocktail party where your great uncle is going on for like 45 minutes and you're like, oh my God, I gotta go to the bathroom. These are five minute long stories. Uh, there will be a bathroom break. We'll have a quick intermission. I always like to know like when I can use the bathroom. So we'll have a quick intermission after our fourth storyteller to kind of reset, um, take a breath, get some water, and then we'll be able to settle back in for our last three. Um, yeah, and we'll hopefully have some time afterwards to mingle around in the lobby and speak to each other about what we heard, how it made us feel, and maybe if it inspired us to take any action that we were not so inspired to take before we um, heard these lovely fo folks share their experiences. Um, so that's what you're in store for. I've been, we've been saying the word story quite a bit, um, and stories can mean lots of different things. So just to kind of let you in on what we think of at, at Speech Act as being um, a story. So as I mentioned, stories, we like to think of them as being on time. So our stories are gonna be about five minutes. Um, we're also really interested in thinking about stories as a vehicle to express some kind of personal change. So in all the stories that you're gonna hear this evening, there will be some sort of shift in the storyteller. They will be different at the beginning of the content of their story than they are at the end of the story. And we think that what happens in the middle, the I used to be this way, now I am this way, what happens in the middle, that's the story. And so that's what we're going to be hearing this evening. Um, all of the stories you're about to hear are true, honest, as remembered by the storytellers. So they're true stories and we're not fact checking them. So we're really going to get this, <laughs> right? I know, in a world of fake news, we really honor the fact that your truth is true. And so we're going to be hearing these beautiful subjective experiences as they were lived by the people who were actually there. So they're on time, there is change, they are true. And as Dean McBride mentioned, all of our stories this evening are on the theme of wellness and health equity. And I think you will soon find that our storytellers approach this with, with incredible bravery and an incredibly open mind about what health and equity and wellness can really mean. And so we're thinking about those, that theme is very broadly defined and all the different ways um, that we encounter um, barriers to health equity, um, you know, challenges to facing our health equity, celebrations and experience of equity and wellness. Um, we'll see that all represented this evening. Um, I'm gonna say now, I'm gonna say something really radical, so I hope I don't lose you, um, but Raise your hand if you have a cell phone. Yeah, I think probably 30 years ago, we might not have all hands up, but I'm seeing mostly hands. Take a second now to go ahead and turn that cell phone off. We're gonna be together for the next hour and a half or so, and so we'll turn our cell phones off so we can really be present. Um, there'll be lots of time to tweet and Tinder later. <laughs> Although this seems like a very eligible room of people, so please don't forget the Tinder part afterwards, it's really important. Um, I jest, but also I don't. Um, great, I'm talking so that we have time to silence our phones, I'm not singing any screens anymore, so I'm gonna take that to mean they're off. Um, lovely. So, health equity and wellness. Yeah, I mean, sure, we all, when we hear this kind of phrase, we think about health, we think about wellness, there's many, many experiences that come to our minds. When I was thinking about this phrase, I was really immediately brought back to being like a young, young child. Um, I was a very, a very shy little boy. Um, I didn't like to make new friends. I didn't like large groups of people. Like I would have hated this. Um, and like I was that kid that like during recess like sat with the teachers and asked them about their husbands. You know, like <laughs> not a very like social little kid because I was really shy. And I now think back on that shyness and I'm like, oh, that was anxiety. Like I was an anxious little kid and I didn't know that that's what I was experiencing and I felt like it was kind of weird and so my shyness was like a protective, a protective strategy for me, a way that I kept myself safe and I kept myself comfortable and it pretty much worked and I had no problem being the one that never spoke up. 
Um, unfortunately for me at that time, um, my mother kind of did have a problem with that. Um, she's a lovely, beautiful, perfect, good enough parent for the social workers in the room. <laughs> yes. Um, and she happened, I happened to have two older siblings who were not shy, very outgoing, very outspoken. So for me, a little kid to be the one that was like having a hard time speaking up, she really felt like that was going to disadvantage me. And she wanted to kind of push me to break through my shyness. Um, and it just so happened in second grade, we got a new music teacher at my school named Miss Popa. Um, and she created this after school group called Music Club, where only second graders, the oldest students in the building, only second graders could go and like after school for 45 minutes, like play the recorder and sing and play the glockenspiel and like have a whole musical moment. Um, she created this group and it was instantly very popular. All the second graders wanted to do it. It was like an elite music group. Um, and I was like absolutely not interested because that did not seem like a place for a shy person. I didn't want to talk to you, let alone sing to you. Um, however, the, you know, the school sent a piece of paper home to let our parents know, and I was very obedient, so I gave my mom the paper, and she was like, you're doing this. Um, and so a couple weeks later, I find myself in the after-school program in music club. Now, Miss Popa, music club alone was scary, but Miss Popa was like a very frightening woman to me as like a little seven-year-old kid. She was infinitely taller than any person I'd ever seen before. She had very small eyes, which there's nothing wrong with, but as a little kid, I was like, that's not something I've encountered before. Like, it must be scary. Um, and so the combination of her and the nature of what we were doing, I was just like trying to not be noticed in music clubs. So I would just sit in the back and like do my hand dances and <laughs> not piss anybody off and just like fly under the radar, um, which totally worked. It was awesome until the dress rehearsal for our final performance. So the second graders, we were graduating, we were, you know, class of whatever that was, you know, like 97. Um, and we were having a performance to celebrate that. And so there was one day, our dress rehearsal was happening in the cafetorium, which if you don't know what that is, it's like half auditorium, half cafeteria. So the second graders were on stage and we're like practicing our songs and our dances and the first graders and the kindergartners are like eating and not watching us. Um, so I remember like I'm on stage with everybody, I'm in the back, I'm doing my part, we're all wearing our khakis and our white polos and we're singing this Andrea Bocelli song, which is <laughs> just time to say goodbye, like very dramatic. And as we start to sing this song, I feel this feeling, like a very familiar feeling. Um, and it's that feeling where you all of a sudden, like one moment you don't have to pee and then you really have to pee intensely, like out of nowhere, like a lightning bolt hit. So I'm experiencing this like bladder pressure and I'm realizing that I have to go to the bathroom, but I know that Miss Popa takes this song in particular very seriously and it does not seem like the time to ask for a bathroom break. So I'm kind of like, okay, just like keep it together, do the dances, like fly to the radar. But as this is going on, you know, like my bladder is getting more and more and more full. And I'm seven, you all, so I don't have a lot of like abilities to do things I can do now. And so it got to a point where I just was like, I, I you know what I had to do. And so you know, I'm standing and then I feel some warmth and then my khakis get a shade darker and then there's liquid on the ground and I'm standing here and people are noticing and people are kind of like looking at me like, oh my God, is he really doing that? And I'm thinking like, am I really doing this? And I was really doing it. And so after I finished doing that, I did the only other thing I knew how to do, which was just to like run away. And I ran away and I got on the bus and I went home and I did not perform the next evening. Um, it was really, horrible, actually. It, it made me feel like just crap. <laughs> um, and so I was okay. My mother, you know, as I said, wonderful parent. She held me. She nurtured me. She made sure I didn't have to go back the next day. But I think back on that experience now, and I think about the strategies I had as a young person to take care of myself. Um, and I think about young people I work with now and those that, you know, step forward and speak up a lot and those that, you know, sit back and don't speak up as much. And I really try to hold the reality in my brain that we're all doing the best we can to take care of ourselves. And it's, you know, worth listening to people when they're telling you um, that they need to function in the world the way they need to function in the world. So thank you. Um, yeah. You're like, I didn't think I was going to hear about P today, but like, there you go, breaking the ice. Um, all right, you did not come here to hear me tell stories. You came here to tell st hear stories from our wonderful storytellers. So I'm not going to waste any more time. We're going to bring them up onto the stage. 
it is scary to tell stories in front of people, um, especially in a beautiful amphitheater such as this. And so we want to make sure that all of our storytellers, but especially our first storyteller, gets a lot of love and support before they come on stage. And so in order to ensure that, we are going to practice a rousing round of applause. Um, and we're going to do this incrementally. So I'm going to ask us, we're going to start at a 1, and then I'm going to kind of guide us through all the way up to a 10. And then that is going to be our like rehearsal, because we want like a 13 for this first storyteller. Does that make sense? Great. OK. Kind of. Just go with it. Trust me. That's the theme of the weekend. Does it make sense? Kind of. Don't worry about it. Um, all right. So we're going to start off like a simple like golf clap, like a nice, subtle, waspy. Great. You can like see the boat shoes and the polos. It's lovely. Okay, so now we're gonna bring it up to like a three. Like you're at like a kid's soccer game and it's like early on a Saturday, but you love your children, so you're there. All right, now let's bring it up to like a five. Like it's an outdoor concert of someone cool, like you didn't buy the ticket, but you're excited to be there. Now let's bring it to like a nine. Like it's a cool person. A 13, it's the Beyonce concert. It's Beyonce! And so really, I just wanted to do that. So thank you, selfishly, for allowing me that. So just that much round of applause for our brave, amazing first storyteller, Kate. It was three days after my 18th birthday. I had graduated from high school near the top of my class. I was a two-sport letter person. I, I was really wicked smart. And I was off to go to the United States Air Force Academy in the third class of women. I was prepared, I was ready, I was excited. I flew out to Denver. My cousin drove me down to the academy, down I-25. It took about an hour and a half, and I was excited. And she dropped me off at the base of the Bring Me Men ramp, and I was ready. I was ready to run, I was ready to do the academics, I was ready for basic cadet training, but I wasn't ready for the racism and the sexism, the sexual harassment that we experienced at that time. The one good thing my freshman year was that I played volleyball. Actually, I sat on the bench, <laughs> but I was on the team. And I met my teammates, some of them in the first class of women, some in the second class, and we all took care of each other. I remember my friend Mo would put M&Ms in my mailbox for me to find. My friends Kathy and uh, Julie Kay and Dennis would march us back after practice across the terrazzo um, so we didn't have to walk on the strips. We had to learn five things that we could say. No, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, may I ask a question? Sir, may I make a statement? And sir, I do not know. That was my experience, and it was hard. So the joy was when we would play volleyball on the road. We'd take a bus, drive up I-25, sometimes to Denver. Uh, Colorado Women's College was one of the teams we played. Or sometimes we got to go up to Greeley and play against Fort Collins. And then we would always stop and have dinner here in Denver, and sometimes we went to Casa Bonita, <laughs> and we play on the slides and enjoy that time. And then as freshmen, we had to wear our full uniforms, but on the bus, we could laugh and joke and play, and the bus would take us further and further, closer and closer to Colorado Springs. And by the time the bus hit Monument, the bus was quiet because we knew what we had to go back to do. And so by the time we hit exit 156B, the turnoff for the academy, the bus was still. Let's fast forward a little bit. I survived, I graduated, and um, I got an email from a friend saying, hey, let's all go up to Vail or Aspen and have a reunion of volleyball players basketball players, uh, rugby players, um, just to have a good time and reminisce about the good old days. So there we are, a bunch of 40, 50-year-old women drinking, playing golf, having a good time, laughing and joking about 
all the good times that we had while we were at the academy. And then my friend Kelly said, the good times, the good old days, they weren't all that good. And we had to talk about it. And we talked about the bad things that happened. And one of those things that happened, not just the racism and the sexism, but women at the academy were sexually assaulted. And we were quiet once again thinking about that. So then, about a year and a half ago, when we're old, retired, moms, grandmothers, lawyers, doctors, engineers, we decided it was time to do something about it. We, we weren't in the Air Force anymore. We didn't have any fears about our careers. And sadly, women and some men are still being sexually assaulted at the United States Air Force Academy. So we banded together, about 15 of us, and now we're called Zoomies Against Sexual Assault. And we meet with the superintendent, we meet with the commandant of cadets, and more importantly, we meet with cadets. We support them, we teach them, we, we attend uh, court martial uh, so that we can support uh, survivors of sexual assault that are courageous enough to come forward. We teach ethics, we cheer on the basketball team, or we go to volleyball matches. And so I drive down to the academy a couple times a month to teach ethics. And it's about an hour door to gate. And as I drive down I-25 and I cross Monument, I don't get that same feeling in the pit of my stomach. I'm not quiet, and when I go tomorrow, I think I'll be okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Kate. Such a beautiful story. I mean, I'm struck so by so many things that you shared, I, the least of which is just really thinking about this supportive network of women, supporting each other throughout those experiences. Yes, round of applause. <laughs> Going back and caring for your community once you've already left, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. And I think it's also worth noting that we had the privilege this weekend of really, or I had the privilege, I'll say, this weekend of really working within a community of very supportive women. All of our participants happened to be um, she, her identified, and so we really got to share in that space together, and I think your story is a beautiful reminder of what women can accomplish when they show up for each other. So one more round of applause for Kate. Thank you. Total sidebar, but this like Casa Bonita situation? So Catherine and I love coming here for many reasons, the least of which is Denver has some great eateries, and I'm feeling like Casa Bonita maybe should be on our list. No, it's bad? Oh, God. Also, this is being live streamed, so sorry, Casa Bonita. Um, so it's bad, interesting. I thought it was good, because you were like, ah, but that was like knowing it's horrible. Okay, cool, great. So never mind, Catherine, we're not going there. Um, okay, cool. So are we ready for our next storyteller? Awesome. So let's give a huge warm round of applause for the wonderful Robin. Okay. In 2001, like any new freshman, I was excited about the classes, the social clubs, the new friends that I was about to make. I was ready to start my new adventure um, into college. For me, when I was looking at colleges, according to my parents, I had three states to choose from. One being staying at home in Colorado, the other, Kansas, and the third one was Oklahoma. And so I chose Oklahoma, <laughs> Oklahoma City. And I enjoyed it, I loved it. I loved the dorms, I loved being around the new people that I had met. My freshman year, during one November evening, 
it was about 6.30 or 7, I would say. I was in a psychology class. I was there for extra credit, and we were answering surveys um, to help graduate students have a better understanding of different um, concepts that freshmen believed. But during that time, I had a massive headache. And I mean a headache where I felt like drums were beating extremely loud in my head. It was making like a loud boom, boom, boom sound. So I decided to lay my head down on my desk and close my eyes to try and get some reprieve from the, the headache. And when I opened my eyes, I woke up to my classmates surrounding me and me laying on the floor. Now that is not something that you want to have as a newly student anywhere, especially a freshman in college. Um, I did not want to be known as the girl who fainted. And I had never fainted in my entire life before. So headaches. Headaches are a symptom of my medical condition, hydrocephalus which is hard for some people to say. Some people say hydra what? <laughs> or they may take an educated guess and some people may say hydrocephalus. <laughs> but it's hydrocephalus. Um, it is a Greek word, hydro meaning water and um, cephalus meaning head. And so what it is, is it's an, an abnormal accumulation of cerebral spinal fluid in the brain. And one way to relieve that um, fluid is by an implementation of a device called a shunt. And so the shunt can either be placed in your brain, your spine, or your heart. And mine was placed in my brain. And if that pressure is not relieved from, your, um, from the brain, it can ultimately be fatal. I was diagnosed with hydrocephalus when I was two months. So I had quite a few surgeries when I was younger, um, before the age of five. Uh, when I turned five, my health leveled out and I went without surgeries for a long time. So I was able to have what you would call a typical childhood. I rode the bus. I even stood up to some of my middle school bullies by flipping them off. Um, I had, due to my surgeries, I had um, a lot of my hair shaved off, so I wore a wig, although my wig spent a lot of time in my backpack versus on my head. Um, it was quite hot and itchy, so I didn't like to wear it too much. Um, my, my childhood, it was, it was good. It was non-eventful. Um, for 13 years, I was healthy. And so when I turned 18 and I was away at school, that headache, that headache scared me. I went to the emergency room and they took a CT scan, a CAT scan, which I'm very familiar with. I've had a lot of those done and it came back normal. Nothing was wrong. So when I came back home, uh, I went to my doctors um, and I was diagnosed with a case of depression. I was put on Paxil, but I wasn't depressed. I felt happy. I enjoyed being away at, to, at school. Um, but unfortunately, I was still put on Paxil. When I went back to school, I started collapsing three to four times a week. My headaches started to increase. I went to emergency rooms, came back home, and went to my doctors again. Still, they couldn't find anything wrong. The, eventually, I noticed that it was hard for me to see the mouse on the computer, and I had to enlarge it. And then I noticed that I was unable to see somebody standing next to me out of my peripheral vision. So my parents and I went to my eye doctor here in Denver, and she looked in my eyes, and she asked one of her interns, have you ever seen this before? And she was shocked. She called my neurosurgeon, this was on a Monday, and asked them to see me. And they said they could get me on on Friday. And she said, no, you need to see her now. So I went to the hospital, and I was rushed into surgery. And they found that my shunt was completely demolished. 
And by that point, my vision was rapidly deteriorating. And they thought that it was going to come back. They said, sure, you know, it'll, it'll come back. But it didn't. It kept declining more and more, even after my eye surgery. Within a six-week period, I could see the numbers, the letters on the eye charts. But after six weeks, I could barely count fingers. I still tried to build up that hope that I would be able to return back to the school that I loved so much that following year. But eventually, I was told that if any vision came back, that it would be within a six-month period. So when December came rolling around, I still did not have my eyesight back. So I had to adjust to life without my eyesight. A week later, I ended up getting my first white cane. So my transition, one being from a sighted individual and to one now being a blind individual was permanent, and my new life would have to take forward into this new transition. Thank you. empathy, they can make us think about our own choices and the way we support or, or don't support others. So there's so much in that story and I want to say thank you for sharing it. One more round of applause for Robin. I'm also just like devastated that I never got to know little kid Robin. She sounds very cool, like flipping off Chloe and not wearing her wig. I'm like, all right, I'm going to learn something from that Robin. Um, yeah, love it, love it, love it, love it. Um, what do y'all think? Are you ready for our next storyteller? Yeah. Do you want to like the one you can follow on? Okay, great. So, um, I'm just gonna bring her up. How about that? Yeah, great, cool. Um, all right, so let's give a huge round of applause for our next great, wonderful storyteller, Nat! moving around to different schools as well. So as a child, we shifted from school to different schools. And with that came along with introductions, being the new kid in school, always being the, the new one. Introductions, they're interesting, aren't they? Because I had to introduce myself by my name, which is unpronounceable for a lot of teachers. So they didn't call on me for a lot of activities. And instead, they called other children. So I was left out, despite being an honor roll student, spelling bee champion, state capital champion. I was left out of these activities. And I had to keep proving myself so I can have a voice. You see, I felt as though they were insecure in asking me how to correctly pronounce it. And I didn't have the confidence to correct them because I was only a child. So what that did was that sent a message to other children that it was okay not to call on me because they're going to follow the lead of an adult. It happened in gym class. It happened in different activities, and I wasn't called on. I also recall that one of my most favorite activities during grade school was, of course, field trips. Come on. Field trips. And as with any excursion, with any adventure, 
you, you eventually make your way to this little room that is filled with awe and treasures called the gift shop, you know, with a bunch of trinkets that is completely useless, but you want something as a memento of that day. Because as a child, that's so important to you. You need something tangible to hold on to. And I remember my classmates running to the corner of the store around this carousel of items with hooks. And I wasn't quite sure what, it what was going on until one of my classmates took off one of the items from the hooks, and it was a keychain with their name on it. Jonathan, Amanda, Rebecca, Jennifer, for me, I stood back because I knew that wasn't for me. I knew I wasn't going to find my name there. And I knew it was another reminder that I was excluded. As I made my way into adulthood, I noticed that people around me with foreign names or names that were different did one of three things. They either went by the first letter of their name, they abbreviated it or shortened it or went by a nickname, or they just outright changed it into something more pronounceable and more Western. And I thought, well, I get it. You know, because there are days when it's actually humorous for people to try to pronounce my name, and then there are other days where it's aggravating, and then there are other days I'm like just exhausted. Oh, this again, you know, not this again. But the one experience that I encounter frequently is when I go up to the counter to order coffee at my local coffee shop. You know the drill. I go up to the counter and I can tell you exactly what's going to happen, play by play. I can tell you exactly every second of what's going to happen when it makes its way through. I order my drink, it makes it, they write my name, and I have to repeat it multiple times, write my name, it makes its way through the conveyor belt of coffee. And then they make the coffee for me, which that joyous sound of coffee brewing, you know, with the foam and the awesome sound. Then it's, it makes its way through to the end of the counter. And then that person has the unfortunate job of having to decipher how to pronounce this. When I have people next to me during the situation, I get to be a little bit of a kind of a, um, kind of a, smart-ass Nostradamus, <laughs> kind of a, and I, I, I tell them, you know, this is what's going to happen, one of two things. They're either going to spell my name or they're going to just call out my coffee drink, but they're not going to actually say my name. Sure enough, they called out the, what I ordered, the drink, and that's fine. That's fine. Today, however, I don't let people do that anymore. When they mispronounce my name, I have the courage to speak up and I correct them because it's something important to me. It's who I am. I won't abbreviate my name like oh, I won't abbreviate my identity. And I won't make it easier for you because it's not supposed to be easy. It's called respect. Respect can be difficult at times but you need the courage to be respectful because I know that my name links to my ancestors, my heritage, my homeland that I lost. It all connects to me. And I was given that name for a reason because it exudes something. It's for me to embrace. I need for you to know my name is Na and it symbolizes swan. Thank you. Thank you, Na. You know, I, I heard, I'm going to paraphrase, I heard some claps. I feel like it deserves a, a larger clap. I heard some of us going there. So I won't abbreviate my name because I won't abbreviate my identity. Like, wait, like that wisdom, I cannot. Yeah, just 
so much to think about now. The way that children watch us, what we model for them, the importance of language and standing up for ourselves. It's, it's such a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing. Um, I want to share with you all also um, this moment. So Nan, I was fortunate to have Nan, my sort of small group cohort. We did some workshopping in small groups today. Um, and when she mentioned the thing about the like keychain nameplate, everyone's like, oh yes, like we all know that, yeah. And I was thinking that like you can tell a lot about a place by the things that they choose to print names on. So like I did a lot of driving around when I was younger and a lot of rest stops. And some, some places it's keychains, some places in mugs. I'm from Florida and I in Florida they do a lot of like um, painted names on dead alligator heads. <laughs> so like that's really weird, right? Um, anyway, one more round of applause for now. <laughs> All right, you all, you've been such a beautiful audience. We've got one more storyteller before our intermission. Are we ready to hear our fourth, our closer for the first act? Yeah? Great. So a huge round of applause for Trish. It's the summer of 1992. I'm seven years old. My twin brother, my mom, and I are in southern Missouri. We're sticky from the summer humidity, but we're snuggled up in a hammock at my grandmother's house. And this is the moment that she shares with us that my brother and I are sperm donor babies. And so this is something that we carry with us through life. I never had this yearning to find out who my biological father was probably because my mother, though she was a single mother, is a saint. She never left me wanting anything. And so it was always just a bit of a quiet curiosity that my brother and I shared. Quiet, too, because there was a layer of shame there. Our, our world writes this story of how children are meant to be made and by whom. And for those of us who don't fit into that story, we're left wondering about our very existence and asking ourselves, am I wrong in some way? And so I carried this along with this feeling that I was always somehow different than my family. My family's wonderful and I, I have so many traits from them, but I always wondered about certain things like, where did I get this adventurous spirit and this desire to travel? And what about my interest in politics and social justice? And how about this yearning to further my education. Where did these things come from? And I cooked up this image in my mind of who my biological father was, and I have no idea where I got this, but in my mind, he was very stuffy, very wealthy, gray-haired man who drove a red Corvette and played a lot of golf. <laughs> and he lived in Scottsdale for some reason <laughs> that I have no connection to. Um, but I think it was easier for me to imagine him as that because then I wouldn't desire to be close to him. So I carried this with me my, my whole life until just about a year ago. My mom got my brother and I subscriptions to Ancestry.com. We both have uh, young children, and so she wanted us to be able to access that other half of our um, kind of genetic uh, side and some medical history. So my brother and I both did the, the DNA swabs. We mailed them in um, with the expectation that we would get a very macro view of um, kind of that side of the family. So it took me by surprise when on my 33rd birthday, I got a text message from my twin brother that said, I think I found him. So these days with Ancestry.com and a simple Facebook search, we were able to locate him. And so I'll never forget um, when I got the news, I was at a cabin with friends and I was driving down from the cabin and it's snowing and my partner Adam's in the passenger seat, my baby girl in the back seat and the pine trees are whizzing by and the snow's falling and Adam is excitedly reading me everything he can find because he's nothing like what I thought he was. He's a psychiatrist and I'm a social worker and we find this article that's about him and his work on power dynamics in intercultural therapeutic relationships and hold on, that's what I write about. <laughs> so uh, I get home and I race to my computer and I'm looking at my grad school papers, literally searching to see if I've cited him in my papers, that's how connected we are. And so of course I couldn't wait that night, uh, my brother and I drafted up a Facebook message to him and it just said, hi, 
we're out here. Um, we're grateful. And I think we're pretty cool, so I thought you just might want to know that. <laughs> and I, uh, I hit send, telling myself I had no expectations. Um, and I wrote that. I had no expectations of outreach, and I sent it. And I waited. And I waited a day, five days, ten days, two weeks. And then I got a reply. I opened it up and it says, I'm not confirming the results of this test. If you would like to contact me, please do so via my email below. And so I said, that's fine. That's, you know, that's what I expected. But about 12 hours later, I got another message and it said, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to seem cold or distant. Please do reach out to me via my email. And so I did. I crafted this email. It took me four hours to figure out what of my life story would be relevant because I thought this was my one opportunity to say, here's who I am, and now we'll be on our merry way. And so I sent it, and he wrote back, and it was triple the length and quadruple the vulnerability, and he shared pieces of himself, and as his story unraveled, I kept finding new things to grab onto. I mean, he is a psychiatrist, and I'm a social worker, and we work with the same populations, but also he's... Uh, he's from South America, and his uh, father, no, his father, my biological grandfather, was arrested for his role um, in a revolution to overthrow the government. And here I am fighting my own tiny revolutions on my Facebook page, at least. <laughs> and he's warm and adventurous and intuitive and all of the things that I like to think that I am. And so this communication continues to today, they're beautiful, they're long, we share articles on what we're interested in, we share pieces of our life story, and in a way that only a psychiatrist and a social worker would, we're constantly processing how it's feeling for us, <laughs> real time. <laughs> and so, as I'm learning these things about him, I'm feeling my own identity just congeal within me, as if having this genetic history gives me permission to be the person that I always knew that I was. And so as I'm writing these emails and asking these questions and saying, who are you? Tell me more, who are you? I know what I'm really asking is, who am I? Thank you. Thank you, Trish. Yeah, let's give it over, Trish. What do we think, you all? Do we think Trish is pretty cool? As she mentioned, yeah, Trish is pretty cool. We agree with you. Love the e-processing. There's definitely, yeah, some robot somewhere is really getting into that, so it's a gift you gave to the algorithm. Um, also, we, we talk a lot um, in the past couple days about scenes in stories, how, stories, like those moments in stories where you really kind of feel like you're watching it in a movie and you're right there with the storyteller. And Trish, I feel like your story is such a beautiful example of that. We're in the car with you. We're at your keyboard with you. We're like, you put us in your brain. And that's a really generous thing to do. So thank you so much. One more round of applause for all of our storytellers in this beautiful first act. So we are now going to take a quick intermission, so feel free to get up, stretch your legs, check your phones, and we'll be back in a bit to hear the rest of our stories. Oh, hello everybody. Welcome to the second half. Um, you know, this weekend, as I'm sure you can already just tell from the stories, has really been a powerful and transformative experience. And I think part of that, or so much of that really, is due to the wonderful, like, as I said earlier, support that is within the group. Some of us knew each other coming into this weekend, but many of us were total strangers, didn't know each other's work, didn't know each other's lives, and we were only together for five hours, if you can believe it, two and a half hours per day. So, in, yeah, so in the course of a very short period of time, people really took the brave step of opening up and the equally brave step of really listening and holding one another's experiences. We talked a lot about how every story that someone shares is an important story and so it's vital that we treat each story as if it was like a precious gem because they are. Um, and this group I think is just really the gold standard of that. And I'm thinking back a little bit now to, oh Naz, um, getting something to drink. But I'm thinking back to Naz's story about sort of like the importance of modeling and what people sort of receive non-verbally. And I can tell just from the quality of listening in the room that that same support that we had in the workshop space really feels like it's present with us right now. Um, yeah, so round of applause for you all, audience, for showing up, for listening. I recognize some of you from the crowd last year, so it's great to see you again. 
Um, and we're gonna continue right on. Naz back, Naz, you get your, get your water? Perfect, great. <laughs> Just killing time until you got here. So now we're ready to start. Um, we know how to applause hugely, so we're not going to practice again. We're just going to go right to a 13 to bring our opener to the second act. Huge round of applause for Mackenzie! <laughs> I'd like to start my story with a quote from Rumi. Yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise, so I'm changing myself. Three years ago, I moved to Denver to start my adventure getting my MSW at GSSW. <laughs> Woo! And I moved overnight from Oregon with my father in his ginormous flame truck down through Utah, across the countryside, to get me on July 1st to GSSW. I showed up in my tan patent leather heels and my little blue lacy dress, and I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed as ever, and I was ready to take on the world. And I had an incredible professor, Kate Ross. If you know her, shout out to Kate Ross. Her energy is unparalleled, and from day one, I was like, okay, this woman is gonna change my world, and I was really excited about it. And I had everything lined up. I had the perfect house, I had my car, I had my classes all picked out. I knew that I wanted to be a social worker that worked with young people, and I wanted to integrate theater and social justice, and I was just like so on fire for it. And so, my first day of class, it's advanced, stand, advanced standing seminar, and I kind of pull her aside after class, and I'm like, I really need to talk to you. I'm missing one piece of this puzzle. I really need a solid placement. So for those of you that don't know, I'll be brief. Placement is an integral part of the social work experience where you get to apply the skills that you're learning hands-on in the community. So a lot of people interview many different places, and oftentimes this process begins in like January, February or so. So I felt a little behind the ball, and my A-type personality was like, I gotta find it tomorrow, you know? And so we're having this conversation, and she just made me feel amazingly heard, and she was like, well, I gotta be honest, I, I run an organization called Yoga for the People, and I want you to be my intern, <laughs> and I was like, Yoga for the people, what are you talking about? So she tells me all about Yoga for the People, this incredible organization she co-founded about 10 years ago, providing yoga in places where people don't typically have access. Homeless shelters, domestic violence shelters, really making yoga accessible um, to everybody, um, and just kind of taking down some of the stigma. <laughs> and myself, I'm like, I haven't done yoga in 10 years and I don't think that I have any place doing yoga, but okay, tell me more. So she tells me, you know, the tasks that I would be doing. I'd be volunteer coordinating and um, kind of overseeing from this macro level um, the, the general run of the show for Yoga for the People. And I was like, that sounds pretty cool. And then she was like, and you'd have to become a 200-hour certified yoga teacher. What? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and I was like, well, no, that's, that's not going to be for me. You know, I can talk about my emotions all day from about here up, but from here down, we're just going to, that's off. That's off, <laughs> out of bounds. I did not want to tap into everything that I was potentially storing in my body and uh, definitely didn't think that getting my MSW was going to be the time to do that. So, proceeded through the summer <laughs> looking for other internships. I think I interviewed in my little dress and patent leather heels maybe like six different places, got six different offers, and I'm just like racking my brain. Like it was eating me up to the point, and it's, it's August by this point, so I'm like freaking out because everybody has an internship, and I'm like, I don't have an internship, I have six offers, and I don't want any of them, and I'm, I'm not sure why. They all were amazing opportunities. They would have been great for anybody. Um, incredible organizations throughout the Denver area, working with young people, working with teachers. And it just wasn't sitting right. I ran all the numbers. I like had this Excel sheet where I was like rating them and all the experiences that I could have with them. And uh, nothing, was, nothing was coming to the surface. So Kate's like, 
I have an awesome therapist and you need to go see her. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, fair. Okay, so I go see a therapist and I'm, it's the first day, I'm sitting in the therapist's office and I'm doing this whole spiel to her basically that you all are seeing. And she's like, okay, center yourself, close your eyes, we're gonna do some grounding. So I close my eyes and I feel my feet on the ground and my hands on my legs and I'm like, okay, what's gonna come to me? And she's asking me some questions and walking me through these prompts and it just kind of hits me in my gut and I open my eyes and I'm like, I think I'm gonna become a yoga teacher. <laughs> I think I'm gonna become a yoga teacher. And I'm like, did that just come out of my mouth? Did, I, did you hear that right? She heard it right. And so that's what I did. And uh, it was the best decision I've ever made. It was non-conventional. It was um, out of the box of what I ever thought that I would do with my MSW. And it really taught me to take better care of myself as a practitioner. It taught me to dig into my story and figure out all the stuff that was swirling around in my guts that I didn't want to pay attention to. And that has made me, you know, a better practitioner overall. So I traded my patent leather shoes in for bare feet and comfy yoga clothes. And I traded all the answers that I thought I had for a hell of a lot more questions. And here I am on my journey towards figuring out my stuff. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. Thank you. Thank you, Mackenzie. Talking to us about self-care, talking to us about pushing yourself this comfort zone plus one, taking a different path, so much beauty. One more round of applause for Mackenzie. Really, really great. Also, in listening to your story this time, and you and like the patent leather shoes and the blue dress and like ready to change the world, it just made me really wonder. I am not a social work like faculty member, and it made me really wonder what all you faculty members must be thinking like during that first day of school when you see all those like first year social work students roll up in their shoes and they're like, I'm, a, I'm gonna change the world. You're like, oh, just you wait. Like, you're gonna do a lot of things before you change the world, and it's gonna involve breathing and closing your eyes and writing a lot of process recordings. Um, but we love it, that's why we love it. Um, totally, gosh, yoga. I was also thinking about that, just that I'm gonna become a yoga instructor, you know? And in this story, it was like, I'm gonna become a yoga instructor, yay! I feel like when I told my parents I was gonna become a yoga instructor, which I'm not, they were like, we're not paying for another thing that you're not gonna do. I was like, but this is my passion! And then it's like 10 years later, I'm like, I don't do yoga. I watch The Real Housewives, and when I go to home, and that's it. Um, Whatever. Now I'm just like talking about things that no one asked about. Um, we should move on. Yeah? Okay, cool. So we've got another storyteller. Um, actually, incidentally, this storyteller on the theme of yoga taught me something new that I did not know existed, which is laughter yoga. Yeah, really a cool thing. I am still learning what it is, but it sounds really fun. Um, and if you have questions about it afterwards, you can ask this next storyteller. So let's give a huge, uproarious laughter applause for Vicky. Twenty-two years ago, almost 23 now, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and followed up with a mastectomy. Needless to say, it was life-shattering. Not long after that, I decided I needed to write memoirs. I didn't know how long I had to live, and I wanted to leave a legacy. I wanted to tell people about my life. I don't know, just record my life. And so I wrote a lot of memoirs, <laughs> really a lot. But I never published a book. It, I had enough for a book, but <clears throat> one of the things I, that happened while I was writing is it seemed the story, the memoirs 
fit into three major categories. One was my childhood as a military brat and a good little girl. The second was my radical youth as a revolutionary. And the third was my adult life with all its ups and downs and work and social life and cancer and whatnot. And those three parts didn't seem to mesh at all. They, didn't, they were so disparate. They didn't fit together. And I didn't know what to do about that. Also, <clears throat> just around that time, just actually a few months before my diagnosis, I started something new. I uh, became a sculptor, a stone carver. And uh, I found that when I was able to uh, get back to my carving after surgery, that all my sculptures were trying to tell me something. But I, I didn't know what it was until after I completed them and I had to come up with a title. And then I realized they were all giving me messages about my life. The one that I completed first after surgery <coughs> was a two-sided figure. I kind of thought, it, thought of it as comedy and tragedy. And the tragic side was a kind of shrouded female figure, their head slightly bowed, and one hand over her left breast. The other side, which I thought of as comedy, was also a, a female figure, kind of in a uh, long robe, and with kind of a face sort of like a mask, like a, a Japanese um, uh, drama mask, but it was a happy face with a big smile. And I named it Look on the Bright Side. I made another sculpture of a dog, kind of in a crouched, playful position with a ball. And it's called Play With Me. And it reminded me that I had to remember what was important in life and take time for the fun things and, and enjoy. Then I had another sculpture. I, I've had many other sculptures, some of which sold, some of which I kept. <clears throat> but one of them was uh, another female figure who's bending over and she's picking up something from the ground. And what she's picking up are little pieces of rock, the same alabaster that she's made out of. And while I was carving it, part of her head came off. It's the only time that happened in my whole carving career. And I didn't know quite what to do. I thought, well, mm, well, let me try to glue it back on and see if I can salvage the piece. And I did. I glued it back on. And uh, you could still see the seam, even though I mixed the glue with some alabaster dust. <coughs> but I decided um, to give her a babushka and texture the top of her head in the babushka. And that kind of hid the seam. And, uh, but I realized that sculpture had actually fallen to pieces. And she had lost her head. <laughs> but I put it back together. And the name of the piece is Picking Up the Pieces. So after writing all these memoirs and making a bunch of sculptures, I um, showed my memoirs to an editor, still thinking it might make a book. And she said, well, I would change it. Instead of having individu individual memoirs in a chronological order like you have, I would instead re uh, rewrite them as um, essays with each one a theme and each one, each chapter, starting with one of your sculptures. So I did that. I rewrote everything. I, I incorporated my sculptures and... And that was good. And actually, what, uh, what I um, 
what came to me from that experience was, you know, all those disparate parts of my life, those three pieces that didn't go together at all, the lines were erased. And I, I realized that, that they were all part of who made me who I am. And so I realized that my work, what I need to do is pick up all the pieces of my life and embrace them all because they're all part of me and all of them together make me whole. And it was that day my healing journey really began. Thank you. My, oh my, Vicki, thank you for that. I mean, I don't, I mean, one more round of applause for Vicki before I say anything, yeah. I love just this, like, message of staying open and, like, receiving information and that this is, you know, healing processes are so complicated and so different from all of us at different points. And so to get to hear, like, the origin story of your healing process feels like a real gift to give us. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I also just want to say we sort of nicknamed a little bit um, Vicky and her group the Craft Queen because we always sort of like, op we, we workshop these stories together. So storytellers sort of share a draft of a story and then we open it up for positive feedback and we also open it up for like constructive criticism. And often the constructive criticism, which I think is the most important part of the process, can be like the scariest because someone just told a story and you don't want to like, you know, make them feel bad, but it, it doesn't make them feel bad because criticism is important. Um, and Vicky was fearless in her craft comment and always had something to say, which I really appreciate. So thank you for the craft. All, your work is re reflected in all of these stories. And yes, and truly the work of all 16 members of our cohort really are reflected in all of these stories. Like it takes a village to craft and create stories that's wonderful. And so even though we don't all have the privilege of standing in front of the mic tonight, you all are up on stage with us and the stories that we're hearing. So thank you for your work as well. Um, all right, you all, I have some good news to share with you and I have some bad news to share with you. Um, and so we're gonna do this consensus style. What do we wanna hear first? Yeah. Strengths-based, okay, so I hear that. I hear the strength base. I also want to make good on the promise I made to the group. And from where I'm hearing, I heard some bad first, some like people that want to get that out of the way. So I will say the bad news is we only have one storyteller left. I know. But strengths based, the good news is we have one storyteller left. Hey! What? Those of you who were here last year, you're like, that joke sounds familiar. I make it every time, but we are going to bring up our last storyteller, so let's give a huge round of applause for Diane! Weird. I grew up as a very spiritual, religious young woman. I was an acolyte at my Catholic church, I went to church every week. I was part of not one, but multiple youth groups. And I remember very vividly attending a youth promise rally. If you are not familiar with these, um, basically they consist of a whole bunch of teenagers all together in one giant room with loud Christian music blaring and everyone is ready to get their promise ring, declaring that they will save themselves for marriage. So I was in this. I was feeling so vibrant, so alive, so Christian, so excited. <laughs> and the priest called up actors for a skit. And in the skit, one young man stood in the center of the stage, and a series of women lined up on the side of the stage. And the young women carried single white roses. Nothing was said, 
the women went up one by one onto the stage, gave their rose to the young man who promptly tore it apart. The petals lie scattered all over the stage. There was a brief pause, and then Jesus came on stage. <laughs> Not the real Jesus, a young man dressed as Jesus. And all these women came together, and they tried to gather their petals, and they tried to tape them together into a perfect, beautiful white rose. And Jesus, the young man playing Jesus, looked on disappointed. So after that rally, I thought, you know, I'm going to be that girl who keeps her white rose. It's going to be beautiful. I'm going to save myself for marriage. I'm going to wear my promise ring every day. It's going to be amazing. And then I went to college. <laughs> and like so many young women, I was raped. I remember walking home that night to my dorm. It was windy, and I was so confused and so scattered. And the only thing I could picture was these petals lying everywhere and just drifting around in the wind all over the concrete. And I got back to my dorm room, and I only wanted to see one person, Jane. Jane was the most unlikely friend I could have found, a gay atheist. And she was a riot. This girl was amazing. She was four foot 11, but she swore like the biggest, brawniest sailor you've ever seen. So after this happened, I wanted to see Jane. I knew she could take my story. I went to her dorm room. She offered me a hug and a glass of water. And I talked, and she listened. And I talked more, and she listened. And we spent some hours together. Then Jane said, let's bring some of the other girls from the dorm in. And I was so worried. I didn't want to share anything that had happened. I was just reeling. But Jane didn't tell anybody what had happened. She just said she wanted to hang out. So a bunch of girls in the dorm room and I just laughed and giggled. And we swapped stories. And Jane was cursing the way she does and telling stories. And as the narrative flowed and I heard ripples of laughter in the conversation, I pictured those petals again. But they weren't strewn all over or flying in the wind. They were floating in the water that Jane had given. And they were brilliant, and they were buoyant, and they were beautiful. My relationship with God changed a lot that day. So did my relationship with the world around me. Friends I didn't know I could be friends with, I became friends with. A community gathered around me and I felt the strength of them. Together, we blossom. And now all the petals are still there, floating on the water, and they're scattered. But the sum of the parts are so, so much greater than the whole. Thank you. Keep it going for Diane. Thank you for your story, Diane. Thank you for, for sharing. I mean, talk about change, right? If we're thinking about these stories as stories of personal change and personal growth, I can't think of a better example of just witnessing and sharing a journey like that with us. And I'm thinking about all of the spaces, in addition to this space, but all of the different spaces, a story like that could be shared and the kind of change in other people that a story like that could affect, and that's huge. So one more round of applause. Yeah, really beautiful. <laughs> women taking care of women. 
not enough, couldn't hear about it enough. Um, all right, you all. So listen, it's been lovely, and we have reached the end of our journey. Um, we have some thank yous, and so I want to make sure we have plenty of time to that. So first of all, a huge, huge thank you to Abby Howard for dreaming up this partnership <laughs> two years in a row, being the person who solves all the problems. Huge round of applause for Abby. Also, equally important to Trish Becker, Dean McBride, and everybody at the University of Denver, particularly the Graduate School of Social Work. I mean, to, to host an event like this and to provide us with this space and to get these storytellers in the room is no small feat, and so we really thank you for that. Um, another huge round of applause to all of you, once again, for coming and holding space and listening to these stories. Stories need ears, and you all provided us with beautiful ears. I'm seeing them all from here. They're lovely. Um, and last but not least, a huge round of applause for all of our storytellers, all 16 in the workshop this weekend. I'll ask all of you storytellers, 16 of you, to please join us on stage. We'd love to take a picture and recognize you for your work. So those that we met and those that joined us this weekend, please come on up. We'd love to see you all here. All right, and so let's, now that we're all up here, one big round of applause for the 2019 Catalyst Stories for Social Justice cohort. Um, I'll